All right. Hello, Buddhist geeks, listeners, and uh, viewers. So I'm excited to talk to one of my teachers, Judith Blackstone, today. Judith, good to see you. And this is our second conversation. Actually, we chatted uh, back in 2018 after um, your book, uh, uh, Trauma in the Unbound Body, um, which was really fantastic. And it's been uh, a, a go-to recommendation for everybody I work with. Um, but you just put out another fantastic book, uh, the fullness of the ground, a guide to embodied awakening. And so I was super excited to talk with you today. And as we were just talking uh, before we started, I felt there's a lot of things you included in the book and address that are very Buddhist geeky that would help contextualize what embodied awakening is to people who come from a Buddhist background. And yeah. so I super appreciate it. I was even actually just delightfully surprised like a, the, your chapter on non-duality. I don't think normally you cover concepts like that in that detail. Um, even though you do it really succinctly. And so that's one of the things I actually want to talk with you today about is, you know, how you decided to include that and kind of contextualize it for Buddhist practitioners. But before we get started, um, let me actually just share a little bit more about you so people can uh, orient. Uh, so Judith is a psychotherapist and innovative teacher in contemporary spirituality, and she developed the realization process, um, an embodied approach to personal and relational healing and non-dual realization. And of course, you can find out more on realizationprocess.org. So before we really dive deep, can you give one of your standard introductions to what the realization process is, which is also the answer to what is embodied awakening? Yeah, that's right. Same answer. Uh, the realization process is a series of practices for uncovering in ourselves a very subtle unbroken, undivided dimension of consciousness. Mm. And that consciousness, because it's undivided, uh, is a dimension of oneness, of wholeness, and mm. of non-duality. Mm. When we uncover it, we experience it pervading our whole body. And at the same time, we experience it pervading our whole environment. And that means that it gives us, at the same time, the ground, the undivided ground of our individual being Mm. At the same time as it gives us that transcendence of our individual being, yeah. our oneness with everything around us. Yeah. And of course, my experience of that, and, and I think how you talk about that, is it's something that we really directly feel right where we are. So this transcendent experience, but the sense of being more of who I am as an individual, it's this both non-duality. Yes. Um, and one of the key instructions uh, in the realization process is to inhabit our bodies to inhabit the body. So can you talk a little bit about that? And I know you, you often have a short practice to kind of point that out. And this is the number one question, even when I work with people and they're very interested, ready to do this kind of practice, they ask the question, am I doing it? <laughs> am I inhabiting my body? Is this it? So maybe yeah. can you help point that out for people? Well, after a while, of course, it becomes unmistakable whether yes. we're inhabiting our body. Um, I start with the main practice in the realization process starts with inhabiting the body uh, bit by bit and then all at once uh, in order for when we then attune to the pervasive space of fundamental consciousness, that it includes our whole body. That it's yeah. not something that we realize out there in front of us as some sort uh -huh. of clear eyed view of the world around us, right. but the oneness includes our own being. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. why I start with inhabiting the body. It is a letting go, uh, but it's a letting go that first requires a bit of concentrated focus mm -hmm. in order to be able to let go from within the whole internal space of ourselves. Yeah. And um, one model we often talk about in Buddhist geeks and in a kind of integral Dharma approach is the difference between spontaneous and gradual paths of awakening. And so and in, in the realization process, it being non-dual, you'll talk about, well, these exercises don't produce fundamental consciousness. We're not trying to create it or um, find it somewhere. It's already present. We're just attuning to our ground of being. And yet you you also embrace, like in the first practice, you know, attunement to fundamental consciousness, a gradual uh, practice and, and, and even making use of concentration. So I always find that, I don't know if there's anything to say beyond that, but it seems like it's just quite natural in, in, in those practices to do that. Yeah, well, what you're saying is is absolutely right. Uh, the realization process can be called both a gradual and a spontaneous direct path in that we're uncovering fundamental consciousness, but it does take a little bit of work. We're not just letting go because I've found that when people 
just let go, just relax yeah. into it, they tend to let go from the surface of themselves yes. into the space around them. And then we don't get to that real subtle, undivided expanse yeah. of yeah. fundamental consciousness. And it seems to impact obviously the the natural feeling of integration into our lives. And I remember one of the first times I did a realization process practice, I had, you know, come from a background of Sogjin and attuning to awareness, especially. I definitely attuned to it very much like here up and even kind of projecting myself out. And I remember that that it was one, I can't remember which instruction it was from the realization process it was the first time it dawned on me <laughs> that this this quality pervaded my whole being and and it helped to re- I felt more relaxed. In the integration, yeah. I didn't feel as separate from everything else happening in my life, which typically that was the case. It's like I sit down and practice. Wow, I feel really awake, and then get up and have all the rest right. of my my life happening. And yeah, yes, it's absolutely applicable to our to our real lives. Yeah, yeah. and so the title of your book, "The Fullness of the Ground." So I'm very to unpack that a little bit. Um, so what is the ground here, and uh, how is it full? Right. Yeah. So the ground is just a word that I use for fundamental consciousness, for that very subtle, undivided uh, space. You yeah. know, I can, we can call it space, we can call it consciousness. It has, in the spiritual literature, the traditional spiritual literature, a lot of different names. Yeah. Pure consciousness, Rigpa, Self of the capital S, all, yeah. all many different names pointing to that same uncovered ground. Uh, so ground is just a word f- for that. Yeah. Uh, basic fundamental transparency that we mm. can open to. Mm. It does feel like the basis of our being. It feels like the basis of everything around us. Mm. So in that sense, it it is a fundamental ground. Um, yeah, and it's full. It's not. Yes. It doesn't. You know, one of the main points of, that I make in the realization process and in this book is that this realization doesn't eradicate either our our own responses to life or the world around us, or yes. our, our love and responsiveness to the world around us. It, so, so that ground is full of life, full of our, our, mm. our life. Yeah, and I find that instruction or that, that highlight to help, I mean, myself and others to really relax. That's a word I will tend to use from like the soak gen, but like in, in realization process, we'll talk about constrictions, right? Uh, constrictions yeah. limiting our ability to, to attune to fundamental consciousness. And I can just see it in people's faces when the, the news hits that you don't have to eradicate yourself and that you know that you get to wake up as you are. Yes. And that you know, relaxing can help. Yeah. That, you know, we actually become more alive. Uh, we experience our our existence. We experience ourselves taking up space in in, in the world in the environment. Yeah. And we experience our emotions. Uh, fundamental consciousness is experienced as stillness. But it's a disentangled stillness because it's undivided. Mm-hmm. It, it's mm-hmm. a letting go uh, of all of our internal experience, our thoughts, our emotions, our physical sensations. All of that can can be felt more fluidly and more deeply when we know ourselves as that pervasive stillness. Mm-hmm. And I disentangling, disentangled is, I think, one of my favorite words and, and to use uh, because it helps point that out for me. Anyways, it's like, okay, I'm not trying to get rid of everything that's happening, including what is difficult. It's just a disentangling, which means I can be more present to what's that's happening. Right. That's right. Yeah. So it's not a distancing, not a detachment or a cutting off from, from ourselves or the world, but it is a disentangling so that we can let life happen. We can let it mm. occur and also dissipate. So we're not grasping on to whatever it is. That's yeah. Happening. And so this relates a little bit. I want, I want to circle back around to some of the, some highlights of what it's like to practice the realization process, but this ties into a few chapters in the book uh, where you talk about two views of non-duality and are we or aren't we? I love that, that, the title. So this hits at home for sure in a lot of different spiritual paths, but especially a Buddhist path. Um, so maybe we can unpack that a little bit. I mean, you do such a great job in such a short period of time to address things that can be talked about in thousands and thousands of pages within the Buddhist tradition. But you talk about Xing Tong and Rang Tong, you right. know, um, empty of other and empty of itself, if I'm, okay. I am get those terms right. Um, and then you talk, we talk about attuning to the quality of self in the realization process. So these are central ideas and concepts that can really shape how we practice, how we... Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think it's important that people 
know that there are these two distinct, they really are fairly distinct categories that the Tibetan Buddhists very nicely laid out for us so that people know why this teacher is saying this and the other teacher seems to be entirely contradicting them. Yeah. And they can also go to whichever teaching they're most drawn to. Ah. Yeah, and speaking of that, do you feel like that shows up for people who practice the realization process, um, that they might gravitate at first to one of those sort of presentations of non-duality? So I'm thinking of like uh, attuning to qualities of emptiness and presence, for example, in the realization process. Do you find people have a sort of doorway in first, and then later they integrate maybe the, the kind of aspect or quality that they tend to miss? Sure. People come from all different directions into the realization process, which is one of the things that's been fascinating to, to teach it. Uh, people come from many different teachers, from many different lineages. And so there, some are, you know, really have a difficulty grasping that now they're going to actually feel their existence. They're not, yeah. they're not going to some kind of non-existent state. And, um, and, and other people need that emptying, you know, they, they need to know that they can let go of their, their uh -huh. grasp on themselves. Yeah. One of the things I love to share with people I work with that seems to help is that it seems that whenever we have at least the, the first conscious experience of inhabiting the body, that depending on our, as you say, the design of our constrictions and openness, it can subjectively feel very different. To each of us so one person they feel heavier another person they feel lighter and so again that that just speaks to like the personal nature of of waking up that's of, of, right. yeah that's right for each of us even going towards this same uh ground of being it, it's our own path you know that we're you know our own set of obstacles yeah and, and our own and, gifts you know? yeah and speaking of the quality of self so i know you always uh We'll address this immediately because depending on the person's path, you know, it may be something like no self is the, is the ideal. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we attune to a quality of self. Yeah. So very important there too, that I'm not saying that there is a self, I, yeah. whatever that would mean really. Right, right. Uh, but, but that's the, interestingly attuning to that quality helps us enter into the wholeness of our being and the, and the self other oneness of non-duality. And I'm not even sure why that's the case, but it is true. So if we, for example, inhabit our legs and then attune to the quality of self, it's it's not an entity, it's just a feeling. Uh -huh. But it's a feeling that enters us into inhabiting our whole being at once. So even though it's a controversial word and can bring up a lot of conversation, yeah. um, I've keep it in because it's it's really a useful attunement. Yes. And um and so speaking a little bit more, like if you were to leave that out, like what have you found happens if, if, if we leave out the tuning to a quality of self within our body? Well, I, I mean, various things, you know, sometimes for, for people who've, who've never been anywhere near the internal space of their body, you know, really beginners in terms of in any kind of introspective work, we might just dwell there, you know, feel that you're in your feet. Uh -huh. Take a moment to just experience what it's like to be there, mm. you know, and not deal with the quality of self, which is a more subtle attunement. Mm. Just, just dwell there and, and feel it, you know. Yeah. Um, but the quality of self will take us deeper. Sometimes mm. even the quality of I am will take us deeper. Mm. And sometimes I've been working with, you know, for example, inhabit your arms, experience that those are your arms. Yes. And that yeah. sense of ownership, yeah. again, creates, for some reason, produces that internal coherence, that, that yeah. oneness. Yeah. Uh, so, so all of those things point to there being some mysterious uh, uh -huh. I am at the, at the basis of it all. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so this is an example for me of um, a highlight of the realization process is that it feels very pragmatic in a lot of ways. So I've, I've heard you talk about many instructions like this where this is what tends to work. Um, or, or you even evolve instructions over time just subtly because you find that if you use this phrase or this pointer, that it just works on average more. Can you speak to that, That how that's played out for you? In, in... I've been teaching this now, I don't know, maybe 40 years. <laughs> and <laughs> yes. so it has, it has certainly evolved. The language has certainly evolved. Uh, 
Yeah. It, uh, it evolves uh, when people say, gee, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. Can you, can you say that a different way? Uh, yeah, I can. I can say it a different way. <laughs> and, and if, you know, if that's more effective and seems to be more effective in general, then that becomes the, the new language. So over the years, um, it has evolved quite a bit. And even in the space of two or three years, it yeah. changed a little bit. Uh, yeah, I find that um, really helpful and fascinating. And I, I feel like it points also to something in my own experience of, of working with however I am in this moment or working with somebody else that like, I've seen you work, you know, with me or with other people one-on-one, -on -one, and then you'll use even more creative uh, pointers, instructions, because that's what tends to work for that particular person, that's which again, right. yeah, that unique design of openness that's and constriction. Right. Yeah. Um, the other thing that stands out for me, I mean, there's a lot, but um, there's a sense of going right for it. That's the phrase I use. And uh, because one of the practices, uh, like attuning to emptiness and presence, as I've mentioned, the Buddhist tradition how many texts are there about emptiness, right? Um, super nuanced, um, hard to fathom the amount of teachings and practice around it. But the instructions for one of those practices very much attuned to yourself as emptiness. And that's it. And there's not a lot of other commentary around it. Now, for people coming from a Buddhist tradition, sometimes it's kind of really striking that it's like there's a feeling or maybe a sense that, oh, no, I need to like work up to that. Uh, and, but that's yeah. not how it's presented. Can you say more about that? The emptiness uh, is a concept in Buddhism, uh, and often it's a philosophical concept pointing to the uh, interdependence of, hmm. life, of everything in life. Yeah. Um, and so emptiness has actually a few meanings in the, in the great, vast yeah. literature of Buddhism. Um, but we're going into it in the realization process as an experience. What does it feel like to be in your body as emptiness, like an empty vessel? What, is mm -hmm. it, what does it feel like mm. to be empty? What does it feel like for the world around, without it disappearing, while it's still there, to be empty? Mm. And then, but interestingly, we don't get to that pervasive space of fundamental consciousness, that very, very subtle Mm. attunement to ourselves in the world until we blend emptiness and presence together. Mm. And that's a fascinating thing. So, yeah. so then the instruction is, okay, that's emptiness. Now, what's it like to be in your body as presence? Yeah. And, and we know a lot of the non-duality teachers talk about presence. So what does it feel like to be present? Not as an idea, right? yeah. but as a feeling. And, and even presence pervading your whole environment without eradicating the environment. So that's presence. Yeah. But then to inhabit your body as emptiness and presence at the same time, what does that feel like? Mm. And then we, we find we get to that clear through yeah. space, that space that really does or really is experienced as pervading everywhere, as permeability mm. of everything. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. And then, the a word that comes up for me a lot with this is the kind of trustworthiness of of fundamental consciousness of our of my ground of being of our ground of being that like now this is who we are and so I feel like the way that you point that out helps to just a little bit more easily come into that uh, recognition and and yeah, relaxing it feels as that like who we are and there's another you know yes. way it feels you know what it's like to to be but that's how it feels not something separate from ourselves not an object of our perception. But it feels like we've uncovered who we are. Yeah, I am uh, curious. Uh, as we were speaking about, you know, how this has evolved over time, um, is there anything that stands out to you in your in your journey as a teacher, teaching realization process? And then tied to that, I'm curious about what you see in this growing world of embodiment of because there's a lot out there now, um, whereas yes. this might have been rare. Uh, even 20 years ago to, to talk yeah. so much about this, especially in the context of, of realization. Um, yeah. So what have you noticed in that journey? And then what are you noticing now in terms of opportunities, but also maybe any challenges or obstacles in the larger space of embodied awakening, if you would feel like speaking on it? <laughs> I, I, I'm very glad to see embodiment come in. I think it's a wonderful thing. For one thing, it, it brings in the psychological aspect of awakening, mm. 
Mm. which has been sorely missing Mm. um, because without that psychological letting go of ourselves, without that healing of the wounds in our, in our heart and our mind, we can't really fully inhabit ourselves. We can't really be embodied. So Mm. in the teaching of embodiment, however, anyone is teaching it, I think um, it begins to uncover the, the, the nitty gritty problems uh, that right. whatever is standing in our way of really getting to the depth of ourselves, the depth of our love, the depth of mm. our understanding. Mm. So I, I think it's a wonderful thing that's come in. I, I haven't found any problem with it at all. Okay, cool. Um, veering off, I have a few different topics related to realization process and especially connected to, to Buddhism. Um, you, you actually mentioned, for example, Buddha nature. In, in your book uh, to kind of point out uh, this recognition of fundamental consciousness within each of us, um, which then automatically s- starts making me feel and think about compassion as it's presented in, in Buddhism, Bodhisattva vow, things like this. How do you see the realization process and, and this recognition playing out in that regard uh, to people who take up the realization process? I know it's not something necessarily explicit, like there's not a Bodhisattva vow, but there, there is something there that's related, I found. I mean, one of the wonderful things, I, I'm, I'm speaking from my own path, when I began to inhabit my body, which was actually quite a challenge for me uh, years ago, <laughs> but it was really quite a challenge. And one of the most amazing gifts of it was when I did feel love just well up inside me spontaneously mm. in, you know, in response. To, to someone, that, that welling up of love and compassion. Mm. Um, it, you know, it's part of our nature and it becomes free mm. Uh, mm. as everything in our nature becomes free mm. as we more fully inhabit our body. Yeah. So, uh, and you know, the, the relational work that I teach, there's a whole aspect of yes, that's, right. that's the relational work. That's called the empathic ground. And it's because as that pervasive space we can really get a sense very deeply of what's going on in another person yeah. uh, the, without leaving our own body, without intruding on them at all energetically. Yeah. But that pervasive space pervading our own body and the body of another person mm. gives us a depth sense of them. Mm. And that seems to evoke a, a natural mm. response of, of mm-hmm. compassion and of kinship mm. as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I uh, use a, a phrase, a verb, a lot, see, feel, and you mentioned that in the, in the book. And so can you unpack that a little bit more? That's something that people often ask me about. They'll hear you talk about it and they'll say, say more about see, feel. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, you know, the way that we experience another person as fundamental consciousness, again, it's, it's, it's one of the most wonderful things about realization or about non-dual realization is the way we can experience another human being. Um, and uh, and we do get this sense. It's it's both a uh, almost a tactile sense of mm. feel within that other person's being, and at the same time can be integrated with a visual. Mm. And um, not everyone has that within within reach. Not a, and actually, people can be very good, even realization process teachers, without that ability. Yeah. But some people find that they can. Uh, actually see where a person lives in themselves, mm-hmm. what emotions they're holding, the movement of shifting mm-hmm. as that person uh, begins to realize themselves or talks about their history, their psychological history. Um, so mm-hmm. we do get a, 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 a perception into the other person without leaving our own being. So it's a perception right. across space. And of course, it's a mutual perception. Mm. We are being perceived at the same time as we're perceiving. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, another area that people will often ask about, especially in Buddhist context, is progressing in the realization process. Because yeah, a lot of Buddhist models have a, a stage-like model of how awakening unfolds. And um, actually, you cover, in a certain way, I, maybe this is exactly what you meant, but you cover different 
um, qualities or, or ways that we might deepen like subtlety um, and uh, depth. And I remember one time in a teacher training, you mentioned that somebody had asked about that and you mentioned a few of these things that, well, it can feel deeper, it can feel more steady. Um, so I'd love, would you say a little bit more about like how a person can sort of assess without getting caught up, you know, in some idea of a project? I, <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, my experience as a teacher has has been co completely aligned with what what all of the traditional teachings say. Yeah. In that first, you get a glimpse of it. Yes. Right. Right. So there's that glimpse. So wow, everything. You know, I'll have people. You know, I'm teaching about this pervasive space, and sometimes people will work with me for months or even for years, and suddenly they'll turn to me and go, "Wow, oh, the space actually pervades everything." Yeah. <laughs> you <know>? Right. Right. <laughs> and. Um, uh, and that can be a glimpse and then and then lost again. But then after a while, with again, with consistent mm. patient practice, uh, you just find yourself there. And the, mm -hmm. the Buddhist term for that is stabilizing. Right? Mm. You stabilize there. Mm. We just find ourselves there. We don't uh, mm -hmm. we don't have to grope for it anymore. Uh, we find ourselves as fundamental consciousness. So that's that's the progression. Now these attributes that I talk about yes. in, the, in the fullness of the ground, those are just different attributes of the experience of non-dual realization. Mm. The, the stillness, that fundamental mm. consciousness is experienced as absolute stillness. Uh, not because we're holding still, we're not at all holding still, but we're uncovering that stillness of the ground. So we get to that, that steadiness, unwavering steadiness. Hmm. And even some of the traditional teachers, Long Champa talks about the unwavering nature yeah. uh, of that, of, I think he'll call it primordial awareness in the yeah. translations I've read. Yeah. Um, so, that, so that unwavering steadiness is, is one attribute, but all the attributes come in at the same time because when we right. realize that, that's predicated on the having reached a certain depth of ourselves, a certain inward attunement to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now that inward depth of contact with ourself is at the same time a uh, depth of contact with the world around us, with other mm -hmm. people, even with the objects in our environment, mm -hmm. certainly with all of nature. So it's in it's a depth yeah. of self and other. And then there's fluidity because of that letting go, because Fundamental consciousness is a dimension of letting go of disentanglement. That means our breath is easier, our energy flows more fluidly, mm. um, uh, all of our emotions. You know, there's a, a myth in the non-dual world that to be enlightened means not having emotions anymore. Right, right. I'm not sure why anyone even yeah. aspires to that. It's right. so terrible to me. Yeah. But but it's at any rate not not correct. Actually, our emotions flow more freely. They mm. do pass by. We don't necessarily hang on to them, but we have that depth and fluidity. So fluidity, depth, stillness. Mm. Mm. Uh, these are all just attributes. Of yeah. The permeability. Oh, and the wholeness. Yeah. That we, that when we uncover fundamental consciousness pervading our whole body. We get to experience our whole being at once. This mm. is a wonderful thing because it actually means that we can think and feel and sense mm. all at the same time. Mm. We can touch with our whole being. Right? Mm. We can see with our whole being. Mm. So that wholeness is a very important aspect of mm. the realization. Mm. Thank you for that. And I remember uh, you mentioned towards the end of the book, um, permeability, the attunement mm. permeability experience of being I forget what the word you used. The, the word I want to say is like a pinnacle, but it's like something is like a defining. You use some fairly strong language around it. And I was very curious about that for you to say more. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is. Yeah, that's that's when you know that that you've uncovered fundamental consciousness, that permeability, that even the the desk seems to be made of fundamental uh, consciousness. There's uh, a sense that we can see and feel through it. We can't, right? We we can't see through it. But there is a sense of it being permeable, of it being made of space, everything being made of space. So one of the more advanced practices when people have done a lot of the embodiment work and so forth is to sit with an object, inhabit your body, attune to the space pervading you and the object until that object becomes 
permeable mm. right? until the mm. space actually pervades the object. So that is the defining mm. attribute mm. of fundamental consciousness. Yeah, thank you. And I remember maybe it was in that same chapter, but uh, you mentioned that uh, you know fundamental conscious pervades even concrete. And I love that you use the word concrete because in the context of spiritual ideals, concrete is probably not high on the list of things that people would talk about being spiritual, you know? So I loved yeah. it because it's like, no, even when I'm walking around, right? In, in the city, right. at a supermarket, wherever, right. there too. Okay. Like cars, everything. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so uh, another area uh, I was curious about is uh, death and the realization process. So death is also pretty central as a topic and practice in, in Buddhism. How have you found realization process helps with this awareness of death? You know, we inhabit the body and as the Buddhism will point out, we eventually grow old and the body falls apart and, you know, we, we die. And so there's a lot of instructions around that. So, you know, preparing for death, going through the death and dying process. Yeah. What have you discovered around that for with the realization process? I do think, you know, from, from the experience I've had as a teacher, that it does help people to let go of themselves mm. when they know themselves as fundamental consciousness, because it is it is a letting go dimension mm. of ourselves. Mm. So, so I do think it it can facilitate that mm -hmm. that passage, right? And even the letting go of the people that we love and things that we love, mm. um, as difficult, of course, yeah. as that is. Yeah. I think. It, facilitates it a, a bit can make it easier hmm. yeah so uh, help us to as uh, another phrase you use a lot is letting go of the grip on our experience that's, uh, that's right. a one that i really love so that would just be perhaps sometimes an even more profound experience of that with regards to the physical body and you also differentiate between physical body subtle energy experiencing ourselves as physical matter subtle energy and and fundamental consciousness i do that because many people have taught and have experienced energy as the most subtle level of themselves. Right. And this fundamental consciousness is even more subtle than our energetic level. With the important caveat that yeah. when we get to the stillness of fundamental consciousness, we also get to an extremely subtle level of our energy, mm. right? A little tiny spanda. Mm. So, uh, so in fact, it's, it, those are eyes together, the stillness of fundamental consciousness and that very, very tiny vibration, mm. uh, uh, the most subtle level of our energy system. Our energy system is also designed on a dense to subtle spectrum. Mm. So, um, so to get to that extreme subtle yeah. level of the energy, we need to get to the stillness of fundamental consciousness. So, uh, so I have a, a very simple practice that I do where I, where I ask people to experience themselves as physical matter, sometimes the hardest for my students, but <laughs> physical matter, like yeah. they just came from the gym, gym yes. and they're made of muscle, and, yeah. and, uh, and then to experience themselves as energy, because many sensitive people, myself included, grow up experiencing themselves as merging with the world around them. Uh, it's completely fluid uh, yeah. and very easily uh, yeah. uh, tossed, tossed around. Yeah. And then to experience themselves as the stillness of yeah. fundamental consciousness, which yes. pervades that, which is not a merging of our own being with everything around us, but a oneness, which mm. is really quite different. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So it seems like just another example of different ways of working with our experience, what we might need to include more or uh, you know, some of us might be more tuned to physical matter, not a subtle energy, but I know in the realization process, and a lot of people, myself included, that I, and people I've worked with, subtle energy is where we can get stuck sometimes, like identifying as subtle energy and not relaxing more deeply into stillness. So yeah, it's a great way to point that out. Uh -huh. um, speaking of working with our experience, so in, in your books, especially the new one, you share a lot of practices. There are a lot of different exercises to, to, to work with uh, in the realization process. And um, you'll even say that, hey, you can record these yourself. You can go through and read them, record them, and then you can play them for yeah. yourself. So again, another example of being very pragmatic, very accessible. Um, at the same time, um, there are teachers like myself and, and so many people yeah. in our community. Um, what are the benefits of working with a, a teacher here? Because that's always a question, right? And, and many traditions, especially in Buddhism, like the importance of working with a teacher. Um, at the same time, again, 
you invite people to work with their experience right now, you know? It, it, yeah. So say more about this, those two. Both can be helpful. I, I've done quite a lot of work on myself, all, all by myself, which has been, you know, which has really given me the, the privacy to, to go deeply in, inside right. and, um, and to discover things that the teacher might not have been able to uh, point out to me. Uh, but of course, there are many benefits also to working with a teacher. For one mm. thing, as we inhabit ourselves, we may come into memories that we really weren't even aware of things happening to us. Mm. And it's good to have someone right there yeah. ready to listen, ready to hear that yeah. uh, for us to be able to express it. Um, and then uh, these very subtle attunements, uh, you know, people often don't know if they're, if they're right. really yeah. there. Yeah. And so it can help to have a teacher who has uh, fine-tuned their perception to be able to see if someone is really in the core, subtle core of themselves, the heart chakra, the head mm -hmm. center, uh, and to be able to say, oh, just a tiny bit to the left, mm -hmm. a bit deeper. Um, and that can be very helpful and something we really might not be able to do ourselves. Yeah, yeah, that's been my experience for sure. And I always tell people, hey, if I could have somebody else facilitating for me, I would totally do that. It's really nice because I can relax more deeply in that. But it is also nice to know that, hey, I can work with my experience right where I'm at right now and I don't have to yeah. wait either. Yeah. Um, the last area I want to talk about is, is at the end of your book, Living Non-Duality. So it was really lovely that you included that. And I wanted to read just one quote um, from that uh, on spontaneity. So you talk about it from different sort of angles, but spontaneity was one of them. So you say spontaneity means that we are present to the unfolding of each moment without preconceptions, without manipulation, without attempting to grasp onto what we like so that it never changes or to eliminate it from our perception and understanding um, anything uh, that we uh, do not like. There's a big difference between approaching life with assumptions and habitual ways of seeing and hearing and actually thinking, actually perceiving. It is like the difference between painting by numbers and actually painting, allowing the painting to evolve on a blank canvas. I love that. Um, you know, what would you want to say to people listening about, so we've been talking a lot about the, the process in, in, in exercises and practices, but then there's something beyond all of the exercises. It's actually living our lives. Uh, so what pointers would you, um, do you want to share here? And I know you cover obviously a lot in the book, but... Uh taking any of the practices into your daily life, right? Just walking down a, a, a street in your town or city, staying embodied, staying attuned to fundamental consciousness, and then bringing it into your relationships if you can. Yeah. Uh, see if you can stay in your core while you, while you speak. Uh, that spontaneity is a, is a healing of self-consciousness. Mm. And so many sensitive people grow up particularly self self conscious, particularly yeah. aware of people watching them and yeah. having to present something that yeah, I might that be appealing, <laughs> uh, might not be judged negatively. So, yeah. interesting thing that happens when we inhabit our body is instead of feeling like the object of other people, we become the subject, looking out back at them, yeah. looking back out at the world, right? So. So then we don't mind being seen. You know, the, the best way to get over minding being seen is to allow ourselves to be seen. You know? Yeah, right. We're seen anyway. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, so that that letting go of our grip on the the image that we're hoping to present, uh, the letting go of the grip on that self objectification. Yeah, of being the object of other people that all becomes much easier mm. as we inhabit the body and as we know ourselves as that disentangled fundamental consciousness. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I definitely really tell what you said there. And you had you had another great quote that I wrote down that spoke to that about switching into just being the subject and not really being caught up in being evaluated and or vigilant, you know, in that sense, which can That's really free up the experience. I mean, it does for me of daily life, everything can change, whether it's relationships, working, just being out and yeah, yeah, out in the world. Yeah. Yes. That's another thing. It's, it becomes easier to let life change, which is mm. so important because mm. otherwise, down, you know, we may feel like, well, we have to hold on to this, but down the road, we find we've trapped ourselves in something we've been holding on to. And yes. so to, to really just let each moment occur without having to grasp onto it, uh, that also becomes easier. Flow, right? Yeah, flow. More fluid. Yeah, I love that. 
Well, Judith, I, thank you. You covered a lot of ground with me today. I really appreciate it. I really super enjoyed your book and it's going to be another uh, go-to reference for myself and people I work with. And um, again, I just want to point people back to the realization process.org website because there's a lot of resources there. You you offer teacher trainings for people who would like to teach this. There are yes. a resource of uh, teachers to find people we can work with online or in person, workshops, events. So there's lots of opportunities to engage in the realization process. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anything else you would want to share? I don't think so. I, th- I think you've done a wonderful job, you know, of, uh, of covering all the bases. I, I, that's yeah. it. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. I really appreciate it, Judith.